What is up, guys? We are going on a new adventure for a new year. That's right. This one's called Chasing Rabbits. So many times in the middle of a lesson in Micah or Galatians or we're, we're studying uh, prophecies or we're studying uh, stories or the gospel and, and you, oh youth, have the most brilliant and poorly timed questions in uh, ever and i love it and i don't always have the time to pursue the rabbit as we're trying to kind of cover something that's really foundational or, or stay rooted in a text so i usually give kind of a quick response and say let's talk about it later but this series is devoted to that kind of pursuit these questions that will send us into the rabbit hole and that's the point of this there are big questions. And we just want you to know, oh youth, that this faith, following Jesus, reading and, and believing in the Bible and seeing the scope of history that has shaped the church, we have been asking tough questions for our entire faith tradition. And so Christianity, this pursuit of Jesus, it's not a pursuit where the, the Bible leaves us high and dry in some of the biggest questions. In fact, the Bible embraces mystery and the Bible also adds clarity. So we're going to try to do both of those things in this pursuit we're calling Chasing Rabbits. <music> We are going to explore uh, questions. Yes, there'll be some answers. Yes, there'll be some, some mysteries. And we're going to try to hold those things together. And these videos are just designed to put a little bit of framework to some of these things so that you can start to build a, uh, an answer or a vision or something to hold on to in these tough topics. So I put out this box in the class. It says, what rabbit do you want to chase? And man, we had some good ones. Um, and I would draw in this box right now and draw, but the first question actually came to me uh, through someone just asking me, and I wrote it down. And the question went something like this. What laws in the Bible do we need to obey? Think of the Old Testament laws, right? I mean, you're thinking about some really old laws. Do they still apply to us? How are we to read them? Are we... Are we supposed to, as followers of Jesus, uh, obey all of these rules? So, what rules? Let me reframe that a little bit, but I think I want to give some, some language to help describe some of the, the differences between uh, laws. Which rules are cultural and which are universal? We'll explore this. So let me provide a little bit of language to maybe helping parse out some of the rules that you'll find particularly in the Old Testament. There are civic rules. You open up your Old Testament, you'll look at rules pertaining to the historic nation of Israel. Very obviously rules that are very specific to the exact socioeconomic country situation of Israel at the time the laws were written, which we'll explore in just a moment. You look in and you'll find ceremonial rules. And what are these? These are pertaining to Old Testament worship culture, talking about rules of cleanliness, rules of unclean clean, uh, rules of, of all these ways to become ritually clean. Are, are these still applying to us today? And then you'll find moral rules. These are pertaining to universal norms for all people at all times, and I'll give you a strong example of that in just a moment. So here we go. Let me just sample from these categories. If we were going to use these categories, what law that I'm about to read, where would you sort it? All right, let's read from Exodus 22.9. In all cases of illegal possession of an ox, a donkey, a sheep, a garment, or any other lost property about which someone says, this is mine, both parties are to bring their cases before the judges. The one whom the judges declare guilty must pay back double to the other. Okay, so which one do you think this is? Is this a moral universal thing? Is this a ceremonial thing? Or is this a civic thing? Well, I would sort this one in civic because the judge's system is something that was set up in ancient Israel was uh, uh, pertaining to their way of, of, of administering justice to the, the tribes of Israel. So uh, very specific items here, right? Uh, ox, donkey. Uh, now, what we're going to talk about in a minute is, is there a principle here that illustrates something universal? Hold on to that thought. But perhaps this is one of those civic laws, very specific instruction of how to navigate the legal system in ancient Israel in a healthy way. Well, what about this one? Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. 
Wow. Okay. Strong statement. Does this mean we can't have tattoos today? Does this mean that we uh, shouldn't do that? Well, this, if I were going to sort this one, I would say this has a lot to do, you look at the context here in Leviticus, a lot to do with ceremonial purity, the unclean and unclean categories of food, of, of dress, of all of these, uh, the body fluids and what animals to touch or not touch. And they all had to do with the symbolic world of life and death. And here there's a lot of religious, uh, cultic context for understanding, uh, what a tattoo or what these marks for the dead would have meant. And I, I would sort this in a ceremonial category. And this has to do with not associating with death because the people of Yahweh in the, in the world of symbol and the ancient Near East, they wanted to associate with life. So uh, they didn't want uh, their, their people associating themselves uh, with, with death, if that makes sense. So, uh, you know, does this apply today? How do you read this? Is this a ban on tattoos? Well, this is this pursuit is designed to answer this kind of query, to give you a little framework to interact with it. All right, what about this one? Exodus 20, 13, you shall not murder. You'll recognize that one from the Ten Commandments. I think we know that this is a, it's a universal, right? This comes from the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are often seen as a, as a paradigm for universal uh, code of law. And it's obvious, you know, from every other place in the scriptures that murdering is not, is not something that is, uh, is a good thing to do. Uh, so does that translate across cultures? Absolutely. It's, uh, it's a very universal, it's this moral law. So these categories, you can sort them, but... There's some words of caution on how to sort these things. So let's dive into the wisdom of Arnold and Bayer, who wrote a fantastic introduction to the Old Testament. Let me read this. Bear with me. It's, it's a bit lengthy, but uh, we'll summarize it, and I think you'll find it very fruitful. Many Christians distinguish among moral, civil, and ceremonial law in the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments, in this view, are the moral law. Laws specific to Old Testament society are civil laws, whereas laws dealing with sacrifices and ritual cleansing are ceremonial laws. But this division into moral, civil, and ceremonial law was unknown in Jesus' day. Instead of the moral, civil, and ceremonial distinction, it is better to accept some of the Old Testament laws of the Old Testament as broad and generally intended for all societies, Others are specific applications to Israelite culture and society that cannot be applied in the same way today to our Western society and culture. On the other hand, much of the world today is closer to ancient Israel than we may think. Do you feel this tension and they're processing this? It's like, well, these categories, maybe they're not so helpful, but there is a cultural element that we have to reckon with. But as we dive into the culture and learn the culture of ancient Israel, perhaps we have better lenses to apply or to see the principles behind these things. Let's keep going. Moreover, rites and ritual actions have no inherent meaning, but rather derive their meaning from assigned and associated significances. Neglect of those assigned meanings result in the loss of the life-giving law of the Lord, whether moral, civil, or ceremonial. If we may ask, yes, but how does this or that law apply to me? The Bible invites us to examine ancient Israel as the model and example. As we compare our situation to theirs, we accept the Old Testament law as confirmed by Christ and with the help of his Holy Spirit and lessons learned from church history, the specifics of how we ought to love God and neighbor should become clear. So let me try to boil all that down. Lots of rich thoughts to dialogue with here. When we ask these kind of questions, that, that this question was asked by one of, one of you youth, fantastic question. When we actually bother to enter into the world of the Bible and to understand the significances of the laws then, be it ceremonial, be it uh, some, some sort of ritual, be it some sort of legal system there, when we examine ancient Israel as a model, we start to understand what is God doing? Why is this good instruction? How does this bring about a fuller and a better and a more whole life in these contexts? How does this shape our view of justice? How does this shape our view of how we operate? operator, what symbols we engage. All of these things help us to build a paradigm for a culture, uh, to analyze our own uh, and, and to interrogate our own culture and to, to try to navigate these things 
by advocating for the things of God around us. So whether that's how do we view tattoos? How do we view, uh, you know, uh, navigating the legal system? How do we do these things? Uh, for example, uh, we're going to go to the New Testament in just a minute, but Paul actually discourages Christians from uh, going to secular court. This is in his letter to the uh, First Corinthians, uh, that if Christians have disputes among one another, that they shouldn't go to the court. Right, but in the Israelite society that we just read about, the judges were actually uh, ordained. It was, it was in the faith community that the judges were there to ordain these things, like go to court so you guys can solve this. So do you, do you, do you hear there, there's this transcultural tension that what God is intending the people of Israel to do when we understand the unique pecu peculiarities and the, 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 the things that were distinct to that time and place, we can actually see the principles and, and, and try to live them out in, in the day and age and the culture that we're in. Does that make sense? I think that's kind of what Arnold and Bayer are trying to, to advise here is let's soak in this stuff before we knee-jerk say, don't do that one, that law you can ignore, that law you, uh, you definitely have to do. Before we do those things, why don't we soak in it? Why don't we soak in it and, and consider the ways of God uh, before we make these decisions? So we see pretty much exactly that in the New Testament. Are you ready to flip to it? So as as the followers of Jesus are no longer uh, part of, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, many of the followers of Jesus were Messianic Jews. They were ethnic Jews. They were part of this covenant nation, but they, they were uh, in, engrafted into this, this new people. Uh, the, the, the Jesus follower are people from all over the world, all tribes and tongues and nations. And, and do those uh, peculiarities of, of what applied to ancient Israel, do they apply? apply to the church. Well, we, we hear the early church wrestle with these things and we actually, they give us a paradigm, a way of demonstrating how they interacted with the law. So how do they do it? I'd like to provide some language for how the New Testament authors kind of deal with these things, um, how they interpret uh, the, the instructions of God. There are cultural rules pertaining to working out the best way to follow Christ in a certain cultural context. Another good example from 1 Corinthians is how Paul kind of deals with the issue of meat eating, which is not hugely controversial to, to 21st century America, uh, although maybe it seems to have become a little controversial, right? You got some people. The first thing we had was the liver, of course. Now we're going to have some lung. saying all you need to eat is meat. Some people say don't even touch the stuff, uh, but that's probably less of a religious debate. But in the ancient world, in the, in the New Testament context that, that, that Paul is writing into in Corinth, this meat eating thing, it was, a, it was a cultural hot topic because pretty much all the meat that was readily available on the market had been sacrificed to idols. So how do you navigate that? What what is the Old Testament instruction and what are the ways and the teachings of Jesus? Uh, does it give us tool? What rules do we need to obey when we interact with something like that? Well, Paul sits with these cultural realities and he, and he gives some frameworks for it. There's also something I would call principle rules. The universal principles beyond cultural contextualization that can be discerned in other cultural contexts. So if you were to, to, to try to think through, okay, the purpose of this law is, and then try to carry out that purpose in the, in the legal system of the culture that you're in, right? And you try to build a bridge between the two things. Does that make sense? Let's, let's try to illustrate it real quick. So here's an example from 1 Timothy, Paul's writing, um, and he actually uses some Old Testament laws to explain his reasoning of why he believes that people who serve the church should get paid. Okay, here we go. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who, whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages. Those two laws that Paul quotes are written about one is about an ox. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, you could say a lot about teachers and preachers of, of the scriptures. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe you could call us cows. <laughs> I don't think that's what he's doing right here. But he's taking a, an idea, right? The the ox 
it, muzzling it while it treads out the grain. In other words, uh, don't prevent this ox from eating some of the grain while you're working that ox. In other words, uh, the way he sees it here is a principle that he's applied from this Old Testament law that, hey, let's pay our teachers because they're working for the church, the good of the church. So let's share with them uh, the bounty that we have uh, in order that they may do that work well. And the worker deserves his wages. So that one's more specifically related to employment. But as you can see, there's this direct reference that he's using and there's this principle that he's applying and he's kind of putting them together and using the Old Testament law to shape what he feels like is the best church practice in the context that he's writing into. And so Paul is inspired by God. So we have this paradigm, we have this way. Look, look at how Paul interacts with the law. That can give us some ideas about how we can as well. We've seen how Paul does this. Perhaps it would be fun to play with an example that would require some discernment. Now here's one we can think through. This is a law from Leviticus 19, and it has to do with agriculture. Is there a principle here? What is the, the meaning? What is the principle behind this law? And how do we take that principle and apply it in our own cultural context? So uh, let's see what you can come up with this. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Okay. All right. So uh, we could woodenly interpret this and say, hey, guys, you're supposed to, to do this. So like the edges of your grass, like don't don't mow it. If you have a lawn, don't mow the edges. OK, edges of your flower garden, don't pick the edges. OK, but what is the principle here? When we interrogate and understand, when we bother to, to become strangers in the, the world of the text and we bother to ask questions like we would if we were in a foreign country, we say, like, well, what is that for? And, and what you find out is this gleaning uh, system. You can read about it in the book of Ruth, right? Ruth is allowed to glean from the fields. The people of Israel were instructed to leave the edges of their field, right? The closest to the roads, uh, unharvested so that people in need could with dignity get food from you. You'd be providing for those in need and they would be dignified in the fact that they work for it. So it's this beautiful way uh, of providing uh, dignified relief to those in need, those that are hungry. This is actually talking about people in need. So you know, do you share the bounty of your harvest? Do you uh, provide dignified ways for people to eat? That's the principle, how we apply that to our culture, how we interpret that into Christian practice. That can be for the wisdom of, of the church in, in many different cultures. And we can learn from different cultures who have interpreted these practices in different ways. And we can be inspired by, by what God is doing. We do this with the spirit. We do this with the counsel of each other. God speaks through his word. He speaks through his church. He, he speaks through his spirit. And we can find ways to live out the intent of the laws of God in the cultures that we're in. Does this give you an encouraging read of, of the rules? Isn't this exciting? I hope this helps you navigate the landscape of the rules more. I hope it makes the, the laws of the Bible a little bit more approachable, a little bit more exciting. What kind of culture is God building? What is the principle behind the instruction he's giving? What kind of cultural homework do we need to do to understand each of these laws? And how do we take all of that picture of God's kind of culture and, and let the Spirit uh, wisen us to, to living that out in our own cultural context today with the help of the Spirit, as we walk out together following Jesus into, and putting on his righteousness. So maybe you'll be a little bit more excited to read the rules of the Bible today after this. So I just want to close with this devotion. I want to read from Psalm 1 and give you a picture. The psalmist paints a picture of someone who, who steeps in, who ruminates in, who roots themselves into the instructions, the, the laws of God and how it actually begins to show us what it looks like to be fully alive and to advocate for the lives of others. So let's close with this meditation. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So may we be like that. 
whatever your relationship is to the rules of the Bible, you're like, this is boring, or this is hard, or I don't know which ones to do, or I don't understand even how to interact with the, the culture of origin. And I, and I don't understand how the, the New Testament authors want us to live these things out. If that's where you're at, I just want to encourage you to sit and soak in it. The laws of God are self-revelatory. They reveal to us his character, his heart, his intent for human thriving. And when we seek to understand what God is attempting to do and what he's attempting to convey, I believe we can be better uh, advocates for the thriving of humanity in our own context, in our own broken system, in our own land of broken laws. We can live out the things of God together as we chew on his word and as we're inspired by him. So let's get into it. Let's get excited about the laws. I hope this video has been helpful and join us next time for another rabbit trail on Chasing Rabbits. Godspeed.